I know it's been a little bit, but I'm back, and I'm here today to give you an updated 2016 NBA mock draft. Please, everybody, contain your excitement. You can check out all 30 picks for round number one in the description box down below. Let me talk about this mock draft a little bit, because obviously there are some changes compared to what you maybe have seen from me previously in the last mock draft. Uh, first, you'll notice at number one, I've got Ben Simmons. It seems like more and more the Philadelphia 76ers are pointing towards taking Ben Simmons at number one. He's kind of been the presumptive number one overall pick for about 18 months now, and everything seems to be indicating that they're leaning in that direction. I don't know that that's the right choice. I don't know that I agree with it, but that appears at this moment to be the choice for the Philadelphia 76ers meaning that the Lakers at number two, at least at the moment it seems like, would have Brandon Ingram fall into their lap, and he would be the choice. I think you're still going to have plenty of debate about this, just not now, but even years to come as well, about who is going to be the better player long term, whether it's going to be Ben Simmons or Brandon Ingram. You know, There's going to be a lot of debate and a lot of discussion about this, um, just like there was for several years, maybe with LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony, the debate you were having leading up to the 2007 draft uh, with Greg Oden and Kevin Durant, for whatever the hell reason there was ever a debate, I don't know. But you're going to get that, who ended up being right here, who ended up being wrong. Both guys have a chance potentially to develop into star players, but both of them have their weaknesses, their flaws, that make them anything but an absolute surefire thing. And it's interesting to me when we talk about how it's kind of played itself out where these two guys are the class of the field. They're clearly the number two or number one and number two picks in this draft. I don't know that they're so far ahead of everybody else where it should really be like that. I don't know necessarily that these two guys are the top two players in this draft. Furthermore, when you look at both of them, I've got to be honest with both Ben Simmons and even Brandon Ingram, who I happen to like more as a prospect, I look at them both. And I don't see either one of them where they just make me stand up and say, you know, this guy's going to be a stud. I know there's no doubt he's going to be a franchise player. I don't get that feeling about them like I did in years past with guys like Kobe Bryant going way back and Kevin Garnett going way back and Tim Duncan and the guys like LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony and Dwayne Wade and Chris Paul and Kevin Durant, you know, Anthony Davis, John Wall. When you saw... These guys in college or high school, depending on the perspective, when you saw these guys, you just knew. And you knew once they got to the NBA, they were going to become stars, if not superstars. And sometimes it's hard to describe and sometimes it's hard to quantify it. I just don't know that I fully get that vibe from either one of these two guys. So while some people will sit there and say these two are a cut above the rest, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that assessment, or if they are, is that uh, a bit of a damning statement on the rest of the talent in this 2016 NBA draft? I don't know. Now, to me, in a lot of ways, at least the way it shapes up at this point in time, the draft really begins a pick three with Boston. They could go in many different directions here. You'll probably see some talk about Buddy Heald. You'll see some talk about Jamal Murray. You're probably going to see some talk even about a Jalen Brown. Hell, who knows? A guy like Marquise Chris from Washington might jump into the mix. I think when all is said and done at the end of the day, the Boston Celtics are in a position here with this pick that they got from the Brooklyn Nets. They have to gamble on a guy with tremendous upside. They have to gamble on a front court player with some size that can do a lot of different things that fits the modern definition of the NBA stretch four. And to me, in my opinion, my opinion, that pick has to be Dragon Bender. Now, I'm high on the kid. I'm not as high on him as I was, let's say, last year with Chris Stops Porzingis. But I look at Dragon Bender, and I think he has similar upside to Porzingis. I just don't think he's quite as NBA ready as Porzingis was last year. And I know a lot of people are going to sit there and say, you know, well, here's another Euro guy, here's this, here's that, or this is an overreaction to what Porzingis did as a rookie last year. Maybe all of that is true. Maybe all of that is true. But when we talk about the Euro players and we talk about how much they're not ready and how far away they are from fulfilling their full potential, frankly, when you look at Ben Simmons and Brandon Ingram, just to name a couple of guys, not to mention the other guys in this draft, they're no closer. So I don't understand sometimes how these Euro players get this stigma of being so much further away and so many light years uh, away from being prepared as opposed to like Ben Simmons and Brandon Ingram. I don't really get it. For the Boston Celtics, maybe they're looking to deal this pick to get a veteran 
You know, but at the end of the day, they do need to get some size in that front court. If they spend this pick on a guard, they're fucking stupid. They're completely ridiculous. At some point in time, you've got to address the front court, and you're in a position here where you've got a guy who arguably has as much upside as anybody in this entire draft. So to me, for where the Boston Celtics are and where they need to go and what they're building for, if they keep this third overall pick, to me, my opinion, it must be Dragon Vendor. Probably the first real surprise that you'll see is that I have Marquise Chris from Washington going number four to Phoenix. You know, you look at this is another team that's very backcourt dominated with guys like Bledsoe and Knight and then last year's first round pick, Devin Booker. Do they really need to add another guard to the mix? Probably not. So in this situation, they need to be looking at the three, the four, or the five. Some type of position there. And when you talk about guys with upside and pure athletic upside, Marquise Chris from Washington probably has as much upside physically as anybody in this draft, including Dragon Bender and maybe somebody like a Jalen Brown from California. Marquise Chris could potentially play some three because even it's 6'9", 220 pounds, everybody might project him as a four, but he's athletic enough to stick at the three. He's athletic enough, in my opinion, to defend the three. Here's a guy with some skill for a 19-year-old player. He's got more skill than you might think in terms of his ability to hit the mid-range jump shot, and eventually he might be able to develop some even three-point range. So when you look at the Phoenix Suns, you need some size. You need something down low. You need something, period. And while I have my concerns about Chris in terms of his ability to rebound at an NBA level, I look at him and I see the physical upside. Some of it screams out Tyrus Thomas, but some of it screams out to me that, hey, this guy could be the real deal. Give him two or three years. And that's why I got the Suns taking him at four. With Thibodeau taking over in Minnesota, to me, the logical choice for them is Chris Dunn from Providence. He's probably the best defensive backcourt player in this draft by a good margin, which obviously Thibodeau is absolutely going to love because he's a defense first coach. Offense is even probably third of tier in importance to him. You know, what are they going to do long term with Ricky Rubio? Do you really think Zach Levine could be a point guard long term? Well, you get Chris Dunn, he could play the one, he could probably play some two. It gives you some more versatility. While you might see a lot of people project a Buddy Heald here, and I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of his ability to stretch the floor and space the floor for guys like Carl Anthony Towns and guys like Andrew Wiggins. You know, at the end of the day, I think when you're in this position, you have to take the best available player. And I could argue at this point in time for the Minnesota Timberwolves and what they're going to be looking to do with their system under Thibodeau, that Chris Dunn would be the best player, not Buddy Heald and not Jamal Murray. Um, another thing you'll notice throughout this draft is that I have quite a number of international players going. You know, teams like Denver and Boston, if they keep all three of their first round picks, uh, the Phoenix Suns have three first round picks. You know, these are teams that would be positioned to take at least one, if not two, international players because in some ways you might want to draft and stash them and keep them over there for a couple of years. Uh, but other teams at the back end of the draft are going to be looking to keep some salary cap space free where they don't have to commit a bunch of money to a guy right away as a rookie, even if the contract isn't that great. So a lot of teams are going to be looking to draft and stash. And frankly, the international class this year is quite a bit better than it has been in years past. Uh, for Bulls fans wondering why I've got them taking DeMontis Sabonis, you know, I like Sabonis a lot. I know they just took Portis last year out of Arkansas, and I like that kid too. Sabonis, I think, could play some center in the Eastern Conference, but I think he has more overall power forward upside than about Bobby Portis in terms of being a starter at the NBA level. I just really like that kid, although I would like somebody like a Denzel Valentine or a Demetrius Jackson. You know, speaking of a Denzel Valentine, I look at him at number 16 in Boston. I'm like, that's such a great logical fit, especially if Boston at number three takes Dragon Bender. You might not get a lot of immediate contribution out of him, and that's fine. But you need somebody that could come in and contribute right away. And I look at Denzel Valentine, his size, the fact that he could play some two, he could play some three, he could be a facilitator, he could defend, he could score some, he could be a passer, he could do a lot of different things, an experienced player, a smart player, a heady player. The perfect type of role player to get in the middle of round one for a team like the Boston Celtics. Now, in terms of some other guys that I expect to shoot up the board a little bit as the draft process continues in the next week or two, I look at guys like um, Sky Labasiri from Kentucky. You know, even though he didn't have a great freshman season at Kentucky, the fact is he's got size, he's got some skill, he's got some athleticism, some range. Teams are going to be salivating at that. Like you'll notice here, I've got him going pick nine. And frankly, when it comes to the draft lottery, 
you guys know how this can go sometimes in the first round of the draft in general. You're going to have some surprises and some guys that get way overdrafted because a team values this or a team values that. That's just the way it is. I look at Wade Baldwin from Vanderbilt, and I see a combo guard that somebody's going to think can play the point at the NBA level. I don't agree with that assertion, but somebody's probably going to think he can play the point. They're going to see a guy at six foot three, six foot four playing the point. He's going to have a lot of appeal to them. As a result, I've got him going 12 to Utah here. I wouldn't be surprised if he's a surprise lottery pick this year. Again, I don't know that I agree with that assessment or that draft range. But that doesn't mean that's not where he's going to end up. I wouldn't be surprised to see Luwabu, excuse me, I always do that, um, from France going in the lottery. In this case, I've got him 13 to Phoenix. He's a guy that could potentially come over and play. He's got 3 and D wing written all over him with that huge, massive wingspan at six foot seven. He's got the wingspan of a seven-footer. Um, you know, Furkan Korkmaz from Turkey, another shooting guard with some range. He needs to grow is into an NBA body, but at 18 years of age, somebody might want to gamble on him, might take him and stash him overseas for a year or two like the Denver Nuggets I've got doing here in pick number 15. I, and overall, when I look at this draft class, you know, I sit there and I wonder how much real impact star potential there is. There's a part of me that says, you know, some of the guys taken after Simmons and Ingram probably end up as better NBA players, guys like Bender, Dunn, Jamal Murray, just to name a couple examples. Jacob Hurdle, the center going 10 to Milwaukee in this mock draft, a guy that I think has been a little bit underrated, frankly, in the whole process. I think in this case, even though the whole thought process was you want to have pick one or two in this draft because it was two guys and then it was everybody else, a bunch of jabronis, I don't know if that's the case. But with that being said, I think the real depth of this class comes not from the impact star potential out of the lottery or out of the first round. I look at the guys that could potentially be available in round two and some of those names, and I sit there and say, you know, you could get some really good players in this draft between picks 31 and picks 45 to 50. So it wouldn't surprise me to see a few teams come out of this draft with multiple guys that end up being valuable NBA contributors because while the top isn't great and even that next level isn't that special, it's when you get into the heart and, you know, of the matter and the meat and potatoes, the nuts and bolts of this draft, you know, there's a lot of guys that fit kind of into that third tier that you can envision finding a role in the NBA and being good NBA players. So if I'm a team in this draft, I want to have – several second round picks, you know, draft and stash a couple guys, find one or two other guys, because I'll probably be able to find some good talent later on. And I wouldn't be surprised if several teams are able to do that. Uh, but again, you can check out my mock in the description box down below. Let me know what you think. I'll be back probably in about a week or so with another mock draft. So stay tuned.